Zwerf, the European Money and Finance Forum, bringing together policymakers, finance, and academia. Welcome to this Zwerf Buffy Bocconi lecture on financial crises and endless saga. The high social costs of financial crises imply that economists, policymakers, businesses, and households have a strong incentive to understand and try to prevent them. And yet, so far, we have failed to learn how to avoid them. Recent research by Professor Charles Kalomiris and Matthew Yaremski on the puzzling persistence of financial crises, an NBR working paper, takes a novel approach to studying financial crises. The paper builds on 10 case studies of financial crises that stretch over two millennia and then considers the salient points of differences and commonalities. Now, before we start, let me thank Swerf fellow Dr. Marty Scheicher, advisor in horizontal line supervision of the ECB for suggesting this event and for coordinating it scientifically. We are happy and privileged to welcome Cornelia Holthausen, a Director General in Financial Stability from the ECB, who will introduce our speakers and moderate the session. Without further ado, over to you, dear Cornelia. Thank you very much, uh, Ernest, and it's a pleasure to moderate this panel on a fascinating question, financial crises and endless saga. So I'd like to welcome you to this webinar and um, yeah, great pleasure also to have the three very distinguished colleagues here today and let me introduce them one by one. First of all, Charles Kalimiris is our main speaker today. He is Henry Kaufmann, Professor of Financial Institutions at Columbia Business School, Director of the Business School's Program for Financial Study and its Initiative on Finance and Growth in Emerging Markets and a professor at Columbia School of International and Public Affairs. And among his many important affiliations, I want to mention specifically from a European perspective, the Advisory Scientific Committee of the European Systemic Risk Board. And his research spans yeah, the areas of banking, corporate finance, financial history, and monetary economics. And he has a PhD from uh, Stanford University in um, economics. Then let me turn to um, the discussants. First of all, Nat is our discussant from the central banking community. Nat is executive director for financial stability strategy and risk, and also member of the financial policy committee at the Bank of England. And previously, he was executive director for authorizations, RegTech, and international supervision, where he oversaw the supervision of international banks in the UK. He has a long career at the Bank of England, where he held positions in risk, financial stability, markets and banking and supervision. And he has a P, um, D. Phil from Oxford with a thesis on occurrence of extreme events in financial time series. So it's ideally suited for today's um, talk. And then John is our discussant from the academic community, and he is director of the Center and Reader in Finance at the LSE. And since he, receiving his PhD in the economics of financial markets from Duke University, he has focused on how economic policy can lead to prosperity or disaster. He has extensive experience in both the technical aspects of risk forecasting and the optimal policies that governments and regulators should pursue in this area. He's also a SWEAR fellow and has worked for the Bank of Japan and the IMF. So let us start. Um, I would give the floor to, to uh, Charles for a 45 minute presentation of this fascinating paper on financial crisis. Please go ahead. It's a pleasure to be with all of you today, a real honor. Uh, I also want to reiterate, this is all joint research with my colleague and friend, Matt Jaremski. The paper is, uh, has been published, the first 10 studies that I'll, I'll talk about mainly today have been, has already been published now in the Journal of Financial Intermediation. We have a book though that we're working on and we have pretty much finished uh, the outline of each of those 35 cases. So the uh, 10 cases have now been expanded to about 35. I won't try to discuss all of those today, but I will just say that what we're finding is that Roughly speaking, the categories that I'm going to talk about today in this taxonomic approach to thinking about crises does seem to work pretty well for spanning the 35 cases too and possibly beyond. Um, so um, it's, it's, of course, a, a bit of a challenge to go through a history paper in a 45-minute time uh, slot. However, I think we can do it pretty well. 
you'll get the gist of it. And then there is the JFI paper that you can read if uh, you're more interested. Uh, going to the first slide, please, the next slide that is. Um, we already, I think all are aware of the, of the costs of crises. And it seems like this is uh, something that has gotten worse over time of uh, the last of several decades have seen some of the most costly crises from the standpoint of GDP loss and also fiscal consequences for bailouts. Um, and we're gonna think about financial crises fairly broadly here to involve stock market crashes, uh, sovereign debt collapses, um, land booms and busts, um, banking crises that involve, of course, where loans are the fundamental asset category. And we're gonna define crises fairly broadly um, across all those categories the same way. It's a time when asset values decline sharply and it's related generally to some sort of change in risk perception. The view that risky assets aren't worth as much today as we thought they were worth yesterday. That we think is a pretty good general definition of what we mean by financial crisis. And of course, you know, these, given how costly these are, we'd all like to avoid them, we think at least. Um, if this risk change is uh, perception is identifiable, if you can see circumstances ex ante where it's likely that you're going to have this kind of major reevaluation, then maybe we could do something that would prevent it um, and avoid the crisis. Next slide, please. And so what are some of the existing answers about that? Well, uh, the minsky kindleberger view is a behavioral economics theory based on oscillating fear and greed, which produces endogenous cycles of high risk taking, followed by crises, followed by low risk taking, uh, when you go from greed to fear. And the view basically is that irrationality explains why this is not avoided. And so, you know, the implication there is, um, regulation should be able to solve the problem. Uh, if you think that it's just a behavioral sort of irrationality uh, that should be avoided. Now, of course, historians have, uh, including myself, have a somewhat different view. We don't see the crises as all the same. And in fact, we'll talk about that today quite a bit. And then the question is, well, if everything's so particular, is there anything to be learned? And of course, in the recent decades, the sort of crisis literature in economics has identified some useful patterns of predictors that do seem to indicate not necessarily that all crises are the same, but that within different categories of crises, you can see some predictable patterns. So for example, um, in banking crises, periods of high loan growth or increases in government protection seem to precede crises and give us some sense of what's contributing to increase risk taking. Um, when we think more as macroeconomists, exchange rate collapses of pegged exchange rates, of course, can be directly traced to unsustainable fiscal or monetary policies. And we can see that in a discussion also of sovereign debt crises. And when we think about stock market collapses, there's a literature in finance that looks at returns extrapolation and momentum as contributing to uh, stock market uh, booms. So we do have some patterns of commonality in the economics literature that suggest that there would be some things that could be preventable uh, in, in, uh, in reducing ex ante risk taking if we wanted to pursue that. I would also say many crises, as a historian, many crises have common narrative features. Um, those of us who were participating in Latin America in the 1990s really saw Mexico in 1994 as almost an uncanny replay of Chile in 1983. And uh, in our book, Matt Jaremski and I are gonna argue that in many ways, Greece 2010 is a replay of East Asia in 1997. I'll talk a little bit about just the Korean episode today. And so we, we think that uh, broadly speaking, the, the record as economists is that there, there are patterns that you can see um, and so it isn't a hopeless idea within just the economics thinking to identify risk factors that one could try to regulate that would reduce 
the instance of crises. But I want to emphasize that's very much within what I'd call the narrow confines of economic analysis. Next slide, please. So the, what I want to talk about in our paper is a broader way of thinking about crises, which really puts them into what I would call a, a, a political or socioeconomic perspective that tries to understand crises as outcomes of, if, if you uh, like, some sort of adaptation process of society that is not just taking the economics of crises in a vacuum and thinking there we as economists then will apply our tools to to fix a problem which i think is very much the way economists generally think about things and what we're we're doing in this paper in this book is challenging that and saying that's really kind of a nonsensical way to think about crises we, we all can agree that crises are not attractive things to live through per se but it's possible that they're stable to things that actually aren't likely to disappear. And in fact, maybe things that we like. For example, we might like democracy, even though we recognize that democracy has certain flaws and that crises, for example, certain kinds of crises may be related to democracies that create political coalitions that uh, seek to extract rents in the form of creating risks for people who aren't in the coalition to subsidize people who are in the coalition. So you might say, well, that's a terrible thing we should prohibit. And maybe the only way to prohibit is to get rid of democracy. And we don't want to do that. So that's an example of our thinking that really, if, if crises are the consequence of certain core um, aspects of how society functions, even if we don't like the costs as economists, maybe we need to think a little deeper about where they're coming from and maybe even open our minds to the possibility that crises are part of an adaptive process. Um, and I'll talk about what I mean by that, but adaptive, I'm borrowing here from the um, evolutionary biology literature to think about how we as societies are evolving and certain patterns that are very common across uh, the whole world. So for example, uh, mo the movement toward flexible exchange rates and uh, inflation targeting and with lots of central bank discretion, that's a worldwide phenomenon. Or the movement toward deposit insurance that happened in the 1980s and 1990s, that's a worldwide phenomenon. So even if you had some ideas about those two topics and were noticing some things that uh, you could make an argument as an economist that they're not desirable in some sense, nonetheless, they seem to be very widely uh, appreciated in the world. And so we have to come to grips with how it is that these choices are being made, even if they are producing more systemic risk. So um, we'll point to these kinds of five categories of ways that you can think about what we mean by adaptive. So first, domestic political economy can create these coalitions, which uh, create risk subsidization. This is particularly true now all over the world in mortgage risk subsidization government programs that basically subsidize mortgage risk. And we know that this is a deep problem. I'll come back to this. I hope I'll have time to come back to it. That it's a deep problem all over the world and it's been very important for contributing to financial crises. Similarly, the protection of banks, uh, deposit insurance and beyond that bailouts has been shown in research. In fact, this is one of the most surprising things really that the finance literature has now shown for about 30 years that uh, deposit insurance expansions of generosity and deposit insurance protection tend to uh, be a positive in, in contributors to systemic risk. If the whole argument for deposit insurance is to reduce systemic risk by reducing liquidity risk, it turns out that the moral hazard consequences more than offset the liquidity risk as an empirical fact that's really been shown in many, many papers. And so, it's then puzzling, why are we choosing to expand the generosity of deposit insurance? And of course, there's a political answer to that that is uh, much, uh, maybe much more robust than the economic answer. So political economy, uh, both in democracies and in, and in autocracies, it works a little differently as Steve Haber and I talked about in our book. But if you, uh, if you don't like domestic political economy of democracies, 
well, uh, you know, that's, uh, I'm not sure how to cure that without getting rid of democracy. Second area is geopolitics. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the early modern experiences of the Mississippi bubble and the South Sea bubble and talk about those as reflecting geopolitical competition where countries faced competitive pressures to catch up, in this case, Britain and, and uh, France, and taking huge risks as part of these very ambitious schemes that they came up with, which were grounded in economics, um, was part of a strategy to avoid themselves from being conquered. Uh, so it's a little hard to see how you uh, should behave differently if you are uh, the king of France or the king of Britain, um, if you don't want to be conquered, you may be taking risks that come out of this kind of adaptation. And then uh, a third answer is learning. I'll talk about the Florida land boom of the 1920s and the uh, stock crash of 1929 in the US. And both of them have been identified with major technological changes and innovations that had unpredictable aspects that caused asset prices to change. Um, and of course, in retrospect, we could say, well, those asset prices went up too far. Um, but in, from an ex-ante perspective, that wasn't clear at all. And so the, uh, in fact, it isn't really clear in the case of 1929 that the prices overreacted. There's, that's a very vigorous debate still. So learning and innovation are kind of very positive kind of adaptive uh, functions. And um, especially given that you can't always tell whether these innovative uh, assets are, are worth more or a little bit less than, than uh, the market says they're worth. Fourth category is what you might call privacy. So I'll talk about how in the 1920s in Florida, uh, there was a lot of evidence for hidden information and fraud and in, including government participation, government officials participating in it, elected officials and regulators. So you might say, well, of course, if we just had better detection of fraud, we could avoid some of that magnification of loss. Fraud tends to magnify loss, not be an independent shock, but rather something that magnifies loss. But how do you avoid fraud? Well, if we all had no privacy, then of course we could uh, eliminate fraud, but we kind of like privacy. So that's an example of a, a, a staple to problem. Um, and then finally, uh, fiat money. So the world has decided to do, go in the direction of fiat money and not just that, but with very flexible inflation targeting, not following systematic rules, but allowing huge central bank discretion. Of course, I'm gonna talk about many times when central bank discretion, the monetary policy of 1929, the monetary policy of the 1930s, the US monetary policy from 2002 to 2005, where that discretion produced, I would say, identifiable major errors. And yet we haven't decided as a society to get rid of discretion, to try to, I, I have been among the economists who's argued in favor of imposing some kind of requirement on central banks to at least announce ex ante, not to stay rigidly committed to, but to at least announce what kinds of, um, if not Taylor rules, some kind of mapping that they're trying to follow that explains their data dependency. Um, but let's face it, I've lost that battle uh, uh, as well as John Taylor and everyone else. And so there's some sort of apparent political preference for central bank discretion without even pre-announcing some kind of commitment. Of course, we noticed that two of the advocates for this in the US edited a book together uh, Rick Mishkin and Ben Bernanke around 2000, as soon as they became government officials, they had advocated for rules-based policy, but as soon as they became officials, they saw the benefit of discretion in a way that we didn't realize they would see before, right? So um, yes, that was an attempt at humor, but uh, there's also a sense in which uh, it's not humor, that it, it seems like two people who were very committed to this idea once they were in themselves at the central bank, they saw a different kind of uh, path. So those are examples of principles that explain what we mean about adaptive crises. Next slide, please. 
And so if, if, if you take that view, it's clear why crises pers can persist and why we're likely to keep having crises because we've chosen to be a society that has all these features, that has democracy, that has privacy, that has central bank discretion, that has learning and innovation. Um, and so you might say the crisis literature should be more titled Know Thyself rather than Be Puzzled. That is just come to recognize that it's kind of an inherent aspect of the kinds of society we want to be, that we're going to have these crises. And you might say, well, that sounds awfully Panglossian. Maybe this guy's just getting old now and has decided that instead of fighting for the bad of the battle to try to reduce identifiable risks, he's just going to give in and say, oh, well, let's just accept it all. Well, of course, I'm not saying that. There's always role for economists to inform policy. But I am saying that I think in a deeper sense, we want to try to understand using tools more like evolutionary biology, what it is that's happening as these crises are recurring and uh, understand and, and be more conscious of it and make it part of our academic discussion instead of being so narrow in our thinking as economists about what, what it is that our job is. Um, we really have to think about what societies we're, we're living in and what we really, uh, what's feasible for us to change. Next slide. So I wanna emphasize this. Uh, if you were coming from outer space to the US and suppose that, or to anywhere on the planet, and you had been away for the last 50 years, you're one of these alien, let's say travelers, and you come to uh, the world in uh, 2020, and you ask someone, could you please catch me up? I've been away for the past 50 years. What are some of the major changes that have happened in the, around the world in the financial system? Um, one of the key ones that you would wanna tell your alien friend that had changed was that the world went from having no uh, protection of the banking system um, outside the United States, let's say circa 1960, to now having almost universal protection of the banking system. And what's really remarkable is how much this changed very dramatically during the 1990s. So if it's really a phenomenon politically that needs a lot more study than it's received. I'll talk about my own studies of it and which followed in the footsteps of uh, uh, Kane and Demirjikunt and Levin. But um, it's really remarkable how much the protection changed. And what's even funnier, of course, is that the academic literature in the 1990s was already identifying the, the fact that deciding on deposit insurance on average actually caused systemic risk to go up. So, that, so if you thought that this was all an obvious uh, you know, adaptation of having, from an economic standpoint, having increased generosity of deposit insurance protection to try to reduce systemic risk, well, you're empirically quite wrong. And nonetheless, politically, this was very popular. And we really need uh, to understand why things like that can happen. Uh, next slide. Another thing that people have been talking about uh, is how the subsidization of real estate risk in the banking system has been very much a contributor to crises. And Jordan et al. is one of the most prominent examples of that research. And yet, when you look worldwide at developed and developing economies, this is looking at developed economies, the, the 17 countries in their sample, uh, you see a, a dramatic increase since the 1970s in the ratio of mortgage lending to total uh, bank lending. So we, I, I can tell you if you brought a banker back from let's say 1900 from any of these countries and you said, gee, I'd like to show you what, what the portfolio of commercial banks is, and it's about two thirds real estate, the banker would have a heart attack. You know, how can you possibly, in a commercial banking system, have real estate loans, which are so cyclically correlated because of the real estate cycle is the business cycle pretty much, and also very long-term assets, which during a recession are very hard to liquidate. So no banker understanding a disciplined banking system from let's say 1900 would believe that anyone would be stupid enough to allow a banking system to have two thirds of its assets in real estate. And that of course is a political uh, outcome and it's related also to the protection of banks 
the reduction of liquidity risk, as, as Sophia Chen and I have shown, is part of what allows, um, that is the deposit insurance protection is part of what allows banking systems to rely so much on real estate. Um, and those historical bankers would not be thinking that way. Next slide. I, I'm really putting this up just to show you in that period, one of the things that came out of the, the 2008 crisis was an understanding that periods of unusually low interest rates, like 2002 to 2005 in the US, are associated with um, low risk pricing. That is reductions in VIX and also reductions in credit spreads in bank loans and in bonds. So one of the things that came out of the research after the 2008 crisis in financial economics was this understanding that when interest rates, central banks set interest rates very low, they also tend to promote risk because the pricing of risk is much more beneficial, that is, uh, to risk, that is, it doesn't, we don't price risk very much. Um, and this period, 2002 to 2005, of course, was a major departure of the Fed from its implicit adherence to a something like a Taylor rule. It was the only time, other than the inflation of the 1970s, when the, the Fed funds rate was deeply negative in real terms for four years in a row. So everyone knew that monetary policy was deviating and was very uh, accommodative in a way that the central bank tried to justify through various arguments about oil markets and geopolitical risks. It was very strange to me watching that happen and with my friends at the central bank doing that. And it of course had a very predictable consequence, which was not just making uh, riskless interest rates low, but making risk premia much lower and of course, that was very much, as John Taylor has shown worldwide, those kinds of effects tend to promote financial crises. So my point, of course, is just in the modern era, when we look at, as the last several decades, when we look at the growth of real estate to, uh, lending within banking systems, the growth of bank protection, and the conscious decision by some very smart economists to have very accommodative monetary policy that promoted risk, that all of this was done very consciously. These were not, it's, it's hard to argue that this, these were just sort of oops, mistakes. These were conscious errors made, uh, I think, recognizing what the risks were that we were taking. And that's a way to kind of motivate why we need to try to understand this is a conscious policy. Next slide, please. And so I've already reviewed our taxonomic approach that can uh, talk a little bit about this persistence. And what we want to emphasize is the variety of crises. We're not going to, we don't think it's very helpful to think that all crises are the same. They're not. But we do think that there's a countable number of factors and that crises tend to have loadings on those factors. Some crises have loadings on one or two of the factors, other crises on different factors. But what's interesting to us is it does seem like there's a finite, fairly small list of factors and that you can understand persistence of these factors, that is, crises do tend to repeat over time. That's not to say they're all the same, they're not, but they do tend to repeat in terms of having loadings on these factors persistently over time, although the loadings of each crisis may vary from crisis to crisis. Next slide, please. So we're going to try to take in our book, uh, as we did in our article, a, a kind of deep dive into this to also, be very careful not to have uh, ex post 2020 uh, hindsight, but um, you know, economists often are making fun of pre-crisis risk taking. We want to avoid that. We want to try to recapture the ex ante perspective. What were people thinking? Why were they thinking what they were thinking? How much information did they have? How reasonable was their behavior? And I guess I would say that you know, most of the time, um, I would say maybe close to all of the time, in my view, the behavior is quite reasonable. That doesn't mean that the risks uh, we as economists can't see that there's some systematic increase of, of risk. But um, this is not going to be an exercise where we're making fun of people for being dumb. Actually, we think that that's been overdone a bit, particularly in the Minsky Kindleberger kind of literature, John Kenneth Galbraith, his sense of humor about people in particular, we, we have a very different view than he does. Next slide, please. 
So uh, this is a table from our JFI paper, and it gives you a sense of how we proceed. We ask questions and we try to get the narrative. After we tell the narrative, we try to ask some questions. Um, we describe the political environment and the economic environment of the, the pre-crisis period. We ask whether the crisis collapse was predictable. In about half of the cases, or a little more than half of the cases, we think it's clear that it was. In a couple of the cases, it, it's clear that it wasn't. And then there are a couple where we think it's unclear. We, we ask, was there a, a price boom that preceded the crisis, as the minsky Kindleberger story says there should be? And in about half of the cases, there wasn't a price boom. I think that's really an important takeaway. It, crises don't always have a, an excess price boom pr uh, prior to the collapse. Were there identifiable political risk subsidies ex ante? And in most of the cases we're gonna describe here, there were, but in three of them, there weren't. Um, was there um, a sort of identifiable shock to interest rates or to risk preferences? And of course, whenever there's a monetary policy um, sort of innovation or shock, you can say yes. And so we do say yes in several of those cases. Was the crisis, pre-crisis period, one in which there was some significant learning about new market developments and new risks? And in you know, about half of them, the answer is yes and half no. Um, was endogenous systemic fraud an important magnifier of the crisis? In about half of the cases, yes and half no. And of course, one of the things that comes when you get up to about 35 observations is you'll be able to analyze, we will be analyzing in the book, not just the variety, but also the covariance across the answers to these questions. Um, and that, that will help us try to understand more deeply how things are linked um, within different typologies, let's say, of crises. So this is very much an open area of research. We don't think we know all the answers to that yet, but that's how we're approaching it. Really, I will remind you that before Aristotle wrote his great works, the first thing that he wrote was the categories. In other words, the first thing you do scientifically is try to figure out how to categorize the observations that you're going to, going to then analyze. And so that's what we're, we're still in that stage of doing, really. Next slide, please. So I've already mentioned, these are kind of the conclusions I, I guess we think are interesting. Some crises come after expansions, but not all. Some crises reflect predictable risks, but not all. Some have identical major shocks that precipitate them, like monetary policy changes, others not. Some reflect domestic political economy risk subsidies, others not. Some reflect this glo global competition that often pushes governments to take big risks, others not. And sometimes there's learning about new markets, sometimes not. And sometimes uh, there's a lot of fraud and other, other times not. Next slide, please. So let me just ask, how much time have I used so far? I think I've used about half an hour, is that right? So I think you have another 15 minutes Great. left and all a little Great. bit more. So I, I've given you the general outline, uh, which I think is, is the most useful thing. And I can't, uh, in the 15 minutes remaining, can't really go through too much of this, but I'm, I'm gonna skip through it quickly. So you'll have the slides and of course the paper is already published. So uh, I don't think that there's much lost here by the fact that I'll, I'll be quick. Let me talk about this, this Roman panic of AD 33. I think the most interesting thing to say about it is um, that it was, was coming from a period um, after the expansion of the empire. So, you know, C Caesar's the time of great expansion of the empire. There's also a lot of sort of economic um, stimulus going on during that period. You could say expansionary monetary and fiscal policy. Uh, afterwards, under Tiberius, this is reversed. Interest rates are rising. Um, and what happens is there's a, a pre existing usury law. And some members of the elite who are want to borrow money or are subject to um, you know, having to borrow in the market, they are complaining because the creditors are charging interest rates above the usury law. That is, the usury law wasn't being enforced. And so the, the shock is, the, the shock that precip precipitates the crisis is that 
some people uh, petition the, uh, the government to start enforcing the usury law. When the usury law is enforced, of course, there's a collapse of credit that comes from the fact that when interest rates are forced to be lowered, the supply of credit is much less. Italian land markets also have a crash um, because the uh, credit available for those markets is reduced. And the reaction of the government is they had a requirement in addition to the usury law that was that all lenders had to maintain two thirds of their wealth in Italian land. And to try to bolster the declining land values, they increased that requirement to try to get lenders to purchase more Italian land. And of course, what that did was it further reduced the lender's ability to supply credit because they had to now, instead of supplying credit, buy Italian land. And actually the price of land collapsed even further and there was a general further collapse of credit. Um, this was brought to an end when Emperor Tiberius created three-year interest-free loans to all the lenders that um, basically put an end to the enforcement. So you can say, well, that's pretty obvious. Usury laws are a bad idea. Economists don't like them. Uh, what was driving the bus here? Next slide, please. Uh, this is just a graph that shows you um, the red lines are what happens when you enforce the usury laws and you increase this new portfolio constraint, you shift the supply curve to the left when you, in, you require more land, more Italian land to be held by lenders as a proportion of their wealth and you enforce the usury law. So you go from the Q pre-crisis equilibrium to the Q after crisis equilibrium, which is a huge contraction of credit. Next slide, please. And so you say, well, what, did, what, what should we have learned? Well, the, the portfolio limit was basically just a capital control. Um, have we learned not to have capital controls and usury laws? And I would say, of course not. You look around the world, in fact, it, within the US, usury laws, believe it or not, are still quite popular for state governments. And so usury laws and capital controls are still tools that are used today because they're accomplishing political tools. By the way, if you try to understand why were the Roman interested in those tools. It was um, a kind of, you could say, geopolitical concern about making sure that there was a lot of wealth near the center of the empire to try to create more political stability within the empire. And in fact, you could argue that that concern was quite wise. So from a political perspective, maybe we can understand why the capital controls and usury laws were in, were in force um, and we can understand this example really mainly as telling us why countries today still do this, um, even though we as economists often tend to find them unattractive. Next slide, please. Here, I'm just going to be very brief. The rise of the modern world is a technological phenomenon as a result of the change in technology of weapons, shipping and navigation primarily, centralizing national power, creating a new coalition of rulers and merchants, to expand their territorial reach outside of the nation state, creating new trade routes and new kinds of competition where the shift is, the center of gravity shifts from the Mediterranean to the Atlantic Ocean. Um, and there are all sorts of innovations here, important tools of conquest and trade expansion, new institutions that are guiding the mercantilist system, joint stock corporations, uh, new types of sovereign debt, the chartering of banks, it's a pretty interesting time and as part of this, we see uh, France and Britain are kind of the laggards in the nations that uh, need to compete with the Dutch, the, uh, the Portuguese, and the Spanish. And then as part of that, we have the creation of very ambitious national schemes, which are reflected in financial booms and busts, which we see in the Mississippi bubble in France and the South Sea bubble in Britain. And the point, next slide, please. You know, we, we could talk uh, about um, how John Law comes to France and what he does, but it's a fairly unbelievably ambitious plan that involves the creation of basically a, a complete partnership between a set of corporations involving trade routes, monetary policy, banking, um, and the state, and tax collection, and 
everything all put together into a grand new sort of scheme that made huge economic sense. Uh, you know, the main historians, ec economists who are historians of this conclude that it, it was sort of a coordination, an alignment of interests and incentives. It all made sense. Of course, it also was a little bit overdone uh, to say the least, and some of that overdoing reflected lots of pressure, geopolitical pressure that was on the French government and that led law to take big risks that didn't turn out so well. Next slide, please. Um, I'll skip over the, well, I'll just say, one of, you know, people who've looked at this have talked about how these systems had big advantages in terms of the incentives for improving, that, that improved the value of sovereign debt um, and made sovereign debt also much more liquid and reducing both of those reduced interest rates on sovereign debt and increased the debt capacity of the nations substantially. So I want to emphasize these weren't just dumb ideas. These were actually brilliant innovations which have stood the test of time. Um, and uh, then when we look at the UK, next slide. Of course, the Bank of England was originated as a sovereign debt swap. And the South Sea Company, which followed it about um, 17 years later, was a second kind of debt stop swap. And they were corporations that were chartered by competing political coalitions, different parties. And uh, they actually continued to bid uh, for sovereign debt as part of these debt swaps. Uh, so that the South Sea crisis was just um, a kind of overpricing of government debt as part of a debt swap in a sort of overbidding by the South Sea Company, which was spurred in part by the political coalition that was pushing them to, to get this uh, government debt for swapping and to beat the Bank of England in its bid for it, which they did by overpricing it. Next slide, please. Um, and so if you were, as, as the historians have looked at this, they talked about the corruption of the government, the way that the members of parliament were creating false information, advertised as part of these different measures. So my point is, if you look at them, you say, well, these are good ideas, now time-tested ideas of how you can reduce the cost of sovereigns of their debt, but they were overdone, um, lots of political pressure, maybe some myopia, things that were quite common uh, and are still common about governments. Next slide, please. Just to give you a sense, the you can see the South Sea Company is the yellow area there. How much of the share of sovereign debt in Britain the South Sea Company held as part of this bidding? And the crisis is in 1720, 21. Um, but the point is that it was very much part of the crisis was driven by an attempt to um, expand its holdings of sovereign debt in competition, by the way, with the Bank of England, which is shown in black below. Next slide. Again, the point being, this was actually not a crazy idea. Um, historians are showing that it, there was liquidity benefits that reduced the yields, as well as incentive alignment that reduced the yields. And it was just overdone by because of the nature of the politics and the competition that underlay the crisis. Next slide, please. Next slide. So, um, and, and next slide, because I think I've already summarized this enough and I'm running out of time. So, you know, the, the, the sovereigns who are taking the big risks are the ones who are behind. As Larry Neal points out, it was the, the very fact that they were behind in the global competition that led them to take these risks. And that was really part of um, understanding the whole crisis. So. You could look at these and sort of tut tut and shake your head and say, oh, they should have known better. But um, I think if I were king of France, I probably would have behaved almost exactly the same. <laughs> uh, you know, I would have trusted John Law. And in fact, his system made sense. And for most of it, it, it was progressing quite well until it was overdone. Next slide. And let's skip one more. Okay, I only have about five minutes left. I just wanna emphasize in the Florida land boom, when you look at what people have done before, again, they take this kind of view that, oh, everyone should have known better. This was just so stupid. Um, 
people were just, you know, beside themselves, you know, with their kind of arrogance and stupidity. We don't think that that is at all what's going on. What's happening is Florida for the first time becomes connected by rail to the rest of the country. And it's happening at a time when the technology for um, improving land is allowing the drainage of swamps and the expansion of coastline. So that all of a sudden by the 1920s, you're able to completely rebuild Florida to get rid of swamps, to drain them, and also whatever coastal areas you'd like to expand, you can expand. And so people start understanding that Florida is now habitable and developable, and there's a lot of interest in it. Next slide. Um, at the same time, people don't really know is that how much um, transportation infrastructure will we need to be able to exploit this? I'd say that was perhaps the major flaw is that the transportation infrastructure couldn't really keep up with very rapid development. And they really also didn't know whether it, the, how much of the land could be transformed and whether you would end up with a huge amount being transformed, in which case prices for land would be very low or very little could be transformed, in which case prices for land would be high. So this gives you a sense. I don't think that any of us would have been smart enough in 1922, 1923 to have been able to answer those questions. Um, so keep that in mind. When, you, when I talk about learning, we, we knew there was a new technology. We knew that Florida was going to be the place where America's middle class would eventually choose as a retirement destination. In fact, they have. And people kind of realized this for the first time in the 20s, and then they started speculating on it, and many of them bought homes. So by some measures, half of the households in the U.S. bought plots in Florida in the 1920s. That's an unbelievable statistic. Many of them did it long distance by mail. That seems also incredible. But if you were thinking about this, if you were there at the time, realizing how quickly prices might run up, I dare say you might have done the same thing. I think I would have, to be honest. So moving forward, next slide. So you can see 20 plus million lots seem to have been uh, sold in Florida. Um, there were some, we don't have good price data, but there are anecdotal indications of very big increases in prices. Um, when the, when the uh, collapse happens, about 10% of Florida's banks are suspended or failed in 1926. But what's interesting is, when we think of this from the banking standpoint, there's sort of two different crisis questions. One is, was the land boom crazy? I've already argued, I don't think it was. Uh, was the banking involvement in the land boom also crazy? So what Jaremski and I found in our other JFI paper uh, which was about just about Florida, is we found that other than the banks that were sort of run by the developers and part of a kind of corrupt and fraudulent scheme, um, the other banks were all extremely conservative in their risk taking and all survived the crisis. So the banks kept their risk management perspective uh, quite well during the crisis, except the ones that were part of the developers group who invisibly uh, sort of took risks and were involved in fraud. I also want to emphasize the developers, you could say it was fraud, but they were the ones who lost the most. They really believed in the Florida boom and were, you know, lost their shirts as a result of this. So that, I think that contributes to the view that it was very hard to know that this wasn't going to be um, as successful as people initially thought. Next slide. This just gives you a sense of how many land permits are being, building permits are being issued. So you can kind of see in the three cities, we don't have much in the way of data. And in fact, it was not possible to do an aggregation of, of the data at the time because things were happening in a very um, uncoordinated way. And so we think that's also relevant to what's going on in the crisis. Next slide. Just to give you a little sense of how people bought things by mail. They, they saw these beautiful advertisements in newspapers or magazines, and then they would mail in their down payments to buy plots. And of course, the advertisements were not particularly honest either. 
Um, but at the same time, next slide, please. Uh, here's an example. Miami Beach is calling you. Miami Beach is calling you. And by the way, Miami Beach is pretty nice. Uh, I can understand how it could be calling people. And these structures that they were drawing here actually did exist. And they're quite successful today. So it wasn't that this was all stupid. It's just that uh, it was a little bit premature, let's just say. Next slide. This gives you a sense. The places that were being developed and being sold in 1925 by, by 2017, you know, these were quite successful. The problem was uh, the price boom really wasn't warranted in terms of its quantity and the pace of the development just wasn't sustainable. I think I've gone on too long. So I'll just say um, we can now talk about many other things. Next slide, please. And beyond that, uh, skip another slide, please. And one more. Those are our conclusions for the for the Florida which I've, uh, crisis, which I've already mentioned. I know I've run out of time, so I have to stop here. I think I've given you a sense of what we're trying to say, and I look forward to your comments and questions. Thanks. Thanks very much, Charles, also for good timekeeping. Um, um, and it was interesting that you walked us through this very early crisis that probably most of us don't know so much about. And uh, I saw in your slides, now we would have come up to the stock boom of the 1920s. So yeah. um, also an interesting episode, but maybe we can all read it up. So I would now hand the floor to uh, the first of our discussants, and that's Nat. And uh, Nat, you have obviously been involved a lot in uh, supervisory and policy work on on financial stability and I'd like to hear from you what you think about Charles' analysis and and of course given that you're in the central bank also maybe you can say something about the role uh, of central banks in this uh, context. Thanks. That's right. Uh, thanks very much uh, Cornelia and uh, a big thanks uh, Charles for uh, to you and your colleagues for 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 the work. I mean I must say there are there are many reasons why uh, I have uh, enjoyed uh, your, your paper. Uh, I'm French and, uh, and British, and I work for the Bank of England, which, uh, as you say, was founded in uh, 1694 to fund the war against the French. Um, also, I studied in Paris, not far from uh, where the first uh, stock exchange crash in history happened in a little street called uh, Rue Quincampoix, which still exists today and which uh, signaled the bankruptcy of uh, John uh, Law as the shares in the French Indies company collapsed. And, and as uh, Cornelia reminded me in her introduction, also did my thesis on uh, the occurrence of uh, extreme uh, events in the financial time series. So there, there are many personal reasons for, uh, for particularly enjoying your paper and, uh, and your purpose uh, here. Um, uh, but uh, specifically, in terms of my, my role, uh, I mean, as Cornelia alluded to, I've been involved in uh, the management of a number of crises uh, in the financial sector over the last uh, two, uh, two decades. And I guess I bear the scars from, uh, from that. And, uh, you know, that's sort of a uh, starts from, you know, 2006, 2007 and, uh, and uh, everything that's uh, happened afterwards, both in the uh, in the UK and uh, and in the in the US, um, so that's another reason why uh, uh, I very much enjoyed your your paper and uh, you know it's uh, it's definitely struck a struck a chord uh, with me everything you've uh, you've said. So uh, big thanks to you, Charles and uh, colleagues, and this is uh, hugely valuable to draw out a taxonomy of uh, past uh, crises and to uh, and to analyze them, because uh, I mean the world that's sometimes I would say. A little too obsessed about change, uh, and sometimes we forget about what we need to preserve. And there's the risk of losing that corporate memory, that institutional memory. Uh, and I, I think there has been many examples of entire generations sort of a, a forgetting the lesson from the past. Uh, and uh, even more recently, we have had, I think, an entire generation of. Uh, um, professionals in the financial sector uh, service who have only known a low interest rate environment and a, a sort of a benign uh, monetary uh, policy stance. Uh, and uh, we are now entering a very, a very different uh, era from that perspective. And it's, uh, it's a sort of a, a world that uh, many, many staff in the financial sector have, uh, have never known. There's just a, um, uh, an example of uh, why it is important uh, uh, to actually understand uh, and analyze uh, past uh, crisis and transmit that uh, knowledge through generations. Um, 
and uh, and not least uh, so that we can you know take that broader perspective which is very important as uh, Gonny, as you say as us central banks and uh, uh, macro prudential uh, supervisors to uh, avoid uh, repeating uh, past uh, uh, mistakes I, one thing i would uh, i would add and i think you've you've correctly called a number of um, factors that were uh, uh, common in a number of uh, past uh, past uh, crises they each have their idiosyncrasies but they had uh, some some common fields. Um, one thing uh, that I think is, uh, uh, in addition to what you say, is particularly important. One factor that is particularly important is the concept of risk culture and incentives in the financial sector, and uh, and I think those have a, a very big role in explaining uh, crisis. You, you've expanded on the relationship between the private sector and the the public sector in, in the past, uh, but I think there's another. Uh, another angle, which is almost a difference in time horizons uh, of different actors, different players. Uh, and what I mean by that is the time horizons of, you know, people's tenures in, in their roles in the, in the private sector uh, versus the horizon of uh, the investor pressure. So you, how often investors demand uh, return uh, and how much of a a slack investors we give to given companies uh, to do the investment work that they need to do, for example, uh, versus the time horizon of economic cycle, uh, in addition to the political cycles and the, and the length of the political cycles that you mentioned. And I think this maturity mismatch, in a sense, of incentives has uh, over time and in history played a, a key role in brewing uh, crises. And for example, if you come back to the bankruptcy of John Law and the, the crash of the French Indy uh, in this company stock, that was a, that was a perfect uh, case in point on that. Um, and of course, that question about incentives and what drives people and what time horizon uh, drives the actions and the decisions of people, uh, we've had some stark reminders of that uh over the past when we look at the past uh, banking failures for example the past uh, a few years and then the question that i think we're losing you nat can you hear us okay there seems to be a technical problem Nat, are you back? Uh, yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. We, I think we lost you in the last sentence or penultimate. Oh, okay. Well, what, what I was saying is that uh, uh, I, I, was, I was getting onto what this meant for authorities. Did you, did you hear that bit? No, no, not yet. So, uh, yeah, so I was talking about this maturity mismatch. Uh, and what this means for the authorities. And I think it means that we've got to be able to understand uh, these long-term trends, these mismatches in the different incentives horizons and spots where the interests of the private sector diverge from the public interest. Uh, so that's the, I think that was, that's the bit uh, where we got, uh, we got cut. So uh, I agree with much of uh, what you say in the paper, uh, Charles. I agree in particular that we have to be humble in our ability to spot and prevent uh, all future crises. And actually we have to accept that we won't, we will fail in doing that. And we have to be at peace with the fact that we won't be able to predict uh, all future crises. And I think if we tried, we risk leading to what some have caused the stability of the graveyard um, uh, in terms of uh, having, you know, completely uh, suppressing any business growth. And in turn, that stability of the graveyard would be really bad for the provision of vital services to the economy, which is the focus of all uh, macroprudential authorities. And those are the people's ability, people's and businesses' ability to save, to borrow, to pay, to make payments, and to ensure themselves in good times as well as bad times. Um, and that brings me to another uh, aspect of what matters a lot to us uh, central banks, which is the fact that we have to balance uh, different objectives. We've got a financial stability objective, and we also have, many of us also have a secondary growth objectives. And one feeds the other. Uh, so we have to ground our macroprudential policy into an understanding of the interactions between the financial sector and the real economy. And I think those interactions underpin a lot of what you've been describing as you've been analyzing uh, past, uh, past crises. And another point, uh, which is another reason why we shouldn't even try uh, 
to predict and sort uh, or prevent all future crises is that it's important to get the different players in the financial sector to face their responsibility for the risks they are taking so that they act as the first line of defense rather than behave as if authorities would always uh, clean up the mess. Uh, and that's sort of a us as central banks being only the last resort, not the first resort, is something that is very uh, present in our mind, which is why uh, we have to strike that balance of, you know, let's not try uh, to prevent uh, all future crises, because otherwise we will end up being the only risk managers in town and we can't have that. Um, so that means we, the authorities, have to be deliberate and focused in what we choose to worry about, uh, because then if we do that, we get others to get through that same thought process. And if they do that, then they will spot issues and fix issues as they, uh, as they spot them. Um, and I agree with you that uh, a policy response uh, can lead to a displacement of risks. And there's a bit of a whack-a-mole uh, uh, that is going on always uh, uh, as you know, uh, policymakers seek to deploy solutions to a given crisis. Uh, we've seen that over the last uh, couple of decades with um, a displacement, a migration of risk from banks to non-banks, uh, which started by uh, risk transforming itself from market risk to counterparty risk for banks, um, and uh, that in turn transforming itself into liquidity risk for their non-banks uh, counterparties. For example, in the form of uh, a lack of preparedness for margin calls, something where you know a topic where many of us have uh, said uh, said very much. So that game of uh, uh, whack-a-mole is definitely uh, at play. So the question for us is, uh, you know, being aware and mindful of all of that, uh, where next? Now, your work, Charles, is particularly relevant at uh, this uh, particular juncture because we are transitioning towards a new era, which is quite uncharted in many respects. And in my mind, it is marked by normalization, which is this return to a more normal uh, monetary uh, policy stance. Uh, in terms of interest rates and uh, and uh, the amount of reserves. Uh, that is not new, definitely not. I mean, we've been there before, but we've just had the generations who've known nothing else uh, than a very exceptional uh, set of circumstances. Um, and uh, the other two big factors that characterize this transition to a new era are climate change and digitalization, as you mentioned uh, in, your, in your paper. Um, and the reality is that uh, many of the crises of the last two uh, decades have been linked one way or another to credit and liquidity issues. But looking ahead, uh, I think uh, it is very likely that operational technological matters will have a greater weight uh, and, uh, and the relative balance of uh, financial stability issues associated with uh, tele technological factors will be, uh, in comparison to financial uh, matters, will be will be sort of a shifting uh, towards the former. And the reality is that there's not yet as much skill in the financial sector about those operational and technological matters as there is uh, a, about uh, managing financial risk. And that can be manifest in the development of artificial intelligence, uh, the uh, ever uh, greater sophistication of cyber attacks, critical third parties. And you mentioned the risk of fraud and um, uh, it was already an issue in past crises, but now with artificial intelligence, that might be taken to a, a new heights. Uh, but also operational frictions in payment systems and in the collateral management. I suspect there'll be more of that and there'll be more of a theme. And that might be part of the grand whack a mole that you are uh, alluding to. Um, now, Meanwhile, uh, as that happens, we have to be using forward-looking tools uh, which ask the uncomfortable questions in advance in the form of things like stress tests or system-wide exploratory scenarios like we've done at the uh, Bank of England. So let me finish with uh, uh, a few more reflections on the, the things you've said in the paper. Uh, I, I was very interested to see you mention evolutionary biology uh, as the better parallel rather than physics. Actually, I'm not sure uh, that uh, physics should be entirely discarded because uh, I think there is something about the second law of thermodynamics, uh, which states that you know the total entropy of a system either increases or remains constant in any spontaneous process, it never decreases. And I think there's something to it in terms of how uh, a crisis uh, uh, impact the state of the economy uh, and how things evolve. So I think there's something in there. So let's not discard physics, I would say. 
Um, yeah, Annette, I'm afraid we have run a bit over time, so why don't I give the floor now to okay. John, and then you will still have a, another possibility yeah. to comment. So, uh, John, over to you. So, you have done some really cutting-edge research on systemic risk, so um, I'd be really interested to hear your views, and also, do we have anything to say in the current research front on systemic risk? Please. To say, I really like this paper, and what I liked about it is I've been irritated by the historical crisis literature for decades, and sort of Charles sort of scratched exactly my itch in his classification. It sort of so it really resonated with me, and what I did is that I, after I read the paper, I put it on my reading list for the autumn, where it joins his fantastic previous book. So it certainly. It really fits well within the canon of these things, and I'm looking forward to seeing how it progresses in this classification thing. But this is meant to be a discussion, so I have to be slightly critical. So I'm trying to, I was scratching, really trying hard to find something I could say. I tried, but let's see how it goes. Next slide. So this question here, this is a quote from this first page, is also my favorite exam question. Why do crises happen? We know we know why they happen. Why can't we pre prevent them? As, and I only I put it on my exam every other year, and it's, it's a really good way to find those who should get an A. But next slide. The summary, of course, is that we know that crises cost a lot of money. But now there's a but. Let me go next slide. So. It's really important when thinking of crisis to think of the counterfactuals, and I think too much research is done with static equilibria. So imagine we have an economy with over a century, we have a 3% fluctuating growth. Next slide, with some crisis in it. If we try to stabilize out the growth path, do we get to the 4%? Next slide. Do we get 3%? Next slide. Or do we get 2%? And we have really no way of answering that. So therefore, we see this crisis, we see the cost, but then we see the attempts at stabilizing the economy, but there's no way of telling us which of these three paths we're gonna end up. And I suspect most people, if you, if you go from the average three fluctuating to the stable two, they would rather prefer the fluctuating three. And I think that, to me, to my mind, that's a critical way to evaluate in crisis. So I want to give three counterexamples of, of a good crisis. Next slide. The first comes from a home country, Iceland. It was a banking crisis with a very sharp drop in GDP. However, the pre-crisis bubble really resulted in a very strong fiscal surplus, a very significant domestic investment, both public and private. Therefore, the country, Iceland was much richer because of the crisis. The creditors were primarily foreigners. And therefore, I'm absolutely convinced, and so are almost all Icelandic economists who looked at it, is that if you go across the cycle, pre-crisis, pre- and post, pre-bubble phase and post-crisis phase, GDP is considerably higher than it would have been. So therefore, if the central bank or the macro approval authorities of Iceland had been successful in preventing the crisis, it would be a poorer place for it. That's a, so that's, a, that's where the counterfactuals become so important. Next slide. And if you take Korea 1997 and look at it from the lens of Schumpeter, Joseph Schumpeter, with, of course, creative destruction and all of that. Well, we do know the Korean GDP fell sharply in the crisis, but we also know that Korea reformed its economy due to the crisis, and a lot of money flowed in that drove investments. So if the crisis and the pre-crisis excesses had never happened, can we really claim that Korea would be richer today or not? Well, we, I don't think we have any basis for doing so. Next slide. This really makes China interesting because if China had taken, paid any attention to any standard crisis indicator over the past three decades, it would have stepped on the brakes 
which would have left China much poorer today. So China is, in a way, the proof that if you ignore all the indicators of excess, you're better off for it. So I th so when talking about crisis and cost of crisis, I really like to emphasize the counterfactual is so important. Just saying we, we can stabilize is not sufficient. Next slide. And I have two papers that look at this. So the and we have these papers on pr what predicts crisis. Well, my papers in in the uh, both of them in RFS in the past few years, they take a long historical sample of risk. And what we do is that we decompose risk into perceived low risk and perceived high risk. What you find is that perceptions of low risk leads to higher economic growth in the future. It leads to more domestic investment. It leads to more FDI. And across the cycle, the benefit is positive, ex with a single exception, if credit growth is really highly excessive. And furthermore, low risk predicts future crisis. High risk is associated with, but not predictive of crisis growth, investment, and FDI. This Tells us a few things. So both of us, this just confirms that every economist believes, right? This is just, and I think the reason why no one else has done it before is that we did this by decomposing risk into high and low, which is what, what made the magic happen. But equally importantly, it tells us that high risk, by the time risk is high, it is too late to do anything about the problem. In other words, high risk is associated with past bad decisions. So therefore, from a policy point of view, a crisis indicator that is looking at some measurements of excesses is looking at something that is too late. You need to look at the behavior that leads to the, those excesses. In other words, when the crisis in 2008 did not happen, because of anything anyone did wrong in 2008. The mistakes were made in 2003 when all these signs says, oh, the world is perfectly safe, let's take more risk. And that included the authorities, the bankers, the pundit, the journalists, and the academics. And that is the type of political economy argument that Charles is so emphasized in his career and there's a political, dim political economy dimension in why it is so difficult to prevent a crisis. Next slide. So ultimately, just to summarize up really briefly, Charles has given us a taxonomy of crisis. I really like the way he's doing this, and I will certainly be paying attention to how this work progresses further because it, I think this is so important. And in my latest interest, which is the next AI crisis and how AI, and it's the, really the way we can think about AI crisis is how AI vulnerabilities interact with financial system vulnerabilities. So in that work, what we have done is we've taken Charles's list or our version of it, which basically says the same thing, interacted with AI, and that's what makes AI both scary and fantastic. And I'm, I think I am, leave it to the Q&A. Thanks very much, John. Very provocative um, view. So uh, we have some time now for all three of you to engage a bit in the discussion. And um, I would have before we then open the chat. Um, I already see one or two questions there, but uh, Charles, so back to you. Great. Well, first of all, thanks to both Matt and John. You know, as I said, I'm in the middle of with Matt writing this book, and your comments I think were very helpful to us. And you will see that reflected in the book, both of you. So I won't go into too much of it. Um, I do, uh, I'll just say, I think John's comments uh, in, uh, that are reflected in his papers, I agree with very much, especially um, this discussion about growth advantages, which Nat also referenced. And, you know, in, in our discussion of cases, the biggest example of that is the 1920s, where you know economic historians have pointed out that the growth consequences of the innovations in the 1920s really continued through the 1940s in the, the biggest diffusion of technological innovation we've ever seen. So I think this is a really great point. Um, I think that the challenging thing, which I'm sure John, John would agree with, is 
to be able to distinguish the cases where that growth is really a big deal from the cases where it's not. So for example, I would say that 2002 to 2005, there wasn't a very positive long-term growth consequence in the US from the real estate risk-taking that we, we took. And in fact, there were lots of building that was done in exurban areas that really wasn't smart from a long-term perspective. Whereas, you know, in the, um, the 1920s, it was quite different. So I think, you know, his case of an Iceland and the 1920s and some other cases he's discussed, I think one of the really interesting questions for us in this book is taking seriously this point that he and Matt both made about this trade-off between growth and instability, um, whether it's possible to come up with identifiers ex ante. So I'll be interested to read your uh, discussions of that question, John, and maybe we can talk about that going forward to see where, where we come out. And I'll stop there. Thanks, Charles. So over to you, Nat. Any any compliments to what you wanted to say earlier, or any reactions? No, the only uh, the, uh, I was done. The only additional thing I was going to uh, mention as an example of lessons not being learned and a recurring feature of uh, crisis was how banks have continuously sleepwalked into large counterparty concentrations since LTCM, the 2008 crisis, the Archegos event, and many other. And that's just an example of, you know, crisis looking very similar to each other. And then to your point, Charles, the question, well, why is that? You know, what is the cause of that? Um, so, uh, no, the only thing I would say, uh, uh, Charles, very much agree with you and John, and uh, the more we can understand the links between economic growth and the real economy on the one hand and financial frictions on the other hand, the better equipped we will be to, uh, you know, to, to focus on the right things uh, from a macro prudential uh, perspective. So that's, uh, that's an area that's uh, not very developed and I, I wish it were more developed than it is at the moment, but there's a, it's, a, it's a really important, uh, really important uh, area. So, um, um, yeah, no, very supportive of uh, what you're doing, uh, Charles, and it's great that you're going to, uh, uh, you know, uh, go for this uh, taxonomy. Thank you, John. So, the, if you're thinking forward, the one point I always like to make is that I think the financial system is the most complex of all human constructs. It's, in effect, infinitely complex, and therefore you ask yourself, how can a supervisor patrol an infinitely complex system looking for something to control? Well, it's it's philosophically impossible task, and crucially, it is axiomatic that a crisis happens where the ECB and the Bank of England are not looking. Because where they are looking, they prevent crisis. We don't know about the crisis they successfully prevented. So therefore, it's almost axiomatic that we end up with a crisis where they are not looking. And to my mind, this is fundamentally the weakness of the macro prudential agenda, because it is really based on the fact we can control effectively an infinitely complex system and prevent misconduct. And to my mind, that is just philosophically unsound. I agree, John. Thanks very much. So, but I thought, um, and it, so in the, so Charles, in the very beginning, you said that over time, crises have become deeper or, or stronger or something like this. And I was intrigued by that because actually just from my experience over the last 10, 15 years or so, I had the feeling that they have actually become weaker in a sense. And that's because we mm -hmm. always step in, no central banks step in, the fiscal authorities step in. And uh, so this, this cushion that we, we provide and, and I think, what, what has been lost a little bit is this what Ned alluded to earlier on that um, that the public sector we we are we are more and more often the lender of first resort rather than the lender of last resort and I think that also speaks to John's comments right now but I wonder how I mean how it was in the past no so right. maybe so, you didn't have so, the possibilities to act so let me clarify because I agree with you I was saying the crises have become much more severe from roughly. 1980 to 2010, um, and so that's what I mean by the recent period. So if you if you looked at uh, data on you know, how many banking crises we've had uh, in the world, 
over that period, the answer is about 100, where the um, fiscal cost of the uh, bank loss during the crisis has a medium of about 16% of GDP. Uh, the Great Depression in the US, which many people think of as a big crisis, and from the US standpoint it was, was less than 3% of GDP, negative net worth of failed banks. And all of the crises of the national banking era from eight, um, 1873 through 1907 in the US, we never had a crisis that was greater than one tenth of 1% of GDP. Um, we did have in the 1920s bank failures. It wasn't a, a, a sort of systemic crisis in the whole country, but we had localized failures that were sort of, you know, above 1% of GDP if you aggregated them all. So my point is, you know, if you go back to, let's say, Australia, 1893, it's probably 10%. It was the biggest crisis that occurred all over the world, similar magnitude to Argentina in 1890. But if you put those two crises aside, Argentina in 1890 and Australia in 1893, both of which were maybe about 10% of GDP, you basically don't have anything. You know, Norway, maybe 1% of GDP, 2%. You know, Italy in, in 1893, less than 1% probably. So my point is, in terms of crisis severity, measured in terms of the net worth of failed banks, the modern era, the current era from 1980 to 2010 is order of magnitude bigger. You know, 100 major crises with fiscal costs of 16, median 16% of GDP. It says, um, and this is reflecting in my mind one obvious influence, which is that government protects banks. And we see that, you know, there's a robust finding that that causes huge increased risk taking. In my view, and I think some of the OECD literature has pointed to this research, I think the big problem that we're having, which, uh, you know, John's point raises is a lot of this is not very productive in terms of growth. That is, the more we're focusing on residential real estate subs risk subsidies, and we're seeing that that's a major theme. The more that's the driver of the systemic risk, the less I think we we should be worried about the trade-off from growth. So I, in other words, what I'm saying is, gee, we do have a kind of easy policy, which is get rid of the subsidization of risk in residential real estate that's coming through these policies. But the problem, of course, is that's a political equilibrium that's very hard to get rid of. So I'll, I'll stop there. Thanks, Charles. And uh, so time is um, going very fast. So I thought we open the floor. Um, I mean, we have a couple of questions in the chat. For technical reasons, I cannot read them, but I would hand over to Martin to um, to select maybe one or two that we, we could discuss. And then I see John has also uh, raised his hand. But for, first to you, Martin. Okay, thank you. So thank you, Charles, for this very interesting presentation. So from the chat, actually, there is one rather long question from Bob McCauley. Hi, Bob, very nice that you are here. So he's asking uh, basically about the characterization of these um, moments, the Minsky moment versus um, rationality. So this is one aspect. And I think more generally, he the point which Bob makes is, so a price de declines versus leverage. So basically for a crisis, do you need a bubble? Do you need leverage? And if I can add one more question, I know we only have six minutes left. So um, given that sort of for me, one of the main themes is at least in the last uh, hundreds of years, banks played a very large role. So, so Charles, if you would be the banking regulator, what would you do? Would you go for <laughs> narrow banking or what, which, which direction would you take? Okay, so those are, uh, I think, two questions. Uh, one is a question about, is it useful to sort crises into crises in which there's, I would say, a banking component, which is the leverage story. That is where we systemically are really you know, increasing our leverage. And I think the answer is yes. Uh, Anna Schwartz said that the thing that really distinguished the most severe crises in all of history was the involvement of the banking system as the leveraging vehicle. 
I think she's right. Um, that doesn't mean that stock market crises are not interesting. They are they are interesting, but um, they don't have the same kind of social costs for exactly that reason. And I'll give a brief answer to the second question. I think one of the interesting intellectual developments of the last 20 years has been among banking uh, economists, the recognition that the reliance on book values of uh, in measuring bank uh, asset values and risk, the reliance as the Basel uh, standards do and the US regulation and all other regulations do on book values is a big mistake and it is avoidable. And when I was chief economist at the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency, I, as one of the major initiatives was to create recognition within the regulator of this academic literature that was talking about how much regulation could get smarter if market values of bank assets, including bank stock prices were used and if volatilities were used you know, through a variety of mechanisms. And so we had actually, for my brief tenure there, a kind of Manhattan project of trying to see how we could improve, how much you could improve regulation if you did that. And people like Mark Flannery and George Pinocchi and, um, and I and Dick Herring have all really tried to argue that this could be systematically brought into the banking system through it's well-designed kinds of COCOS requirements, not like any of the COCOS requirements that we have, by the way. So I think that that's a really fruitful direction. Um, and I, of course, the bankers don't want regulation. We saw in the US this crisis we had in 2023, we thought that this was an avoidable problem, right? We learned in our own savings and loan crisis, well, my goodness, you shouldn't allow the banks to uh, be able to hold bonds and pretend that their book value, which is substantially below their market value, was their true value. We thought we learned that in the savings and loan crisis in the 1980s, and then, oh my goodness, we still haven't learned it, and we did it again. And then when those of us are saying, isn't it about time that we just mark to market the bond holdings of the banks? Uh, this is a big crisis, a big political crisis. You can't get them to do it. And by the way, as Cornelian knows, you know, in Europe, we had a lot of discussion about how sovereign debt should be treated within uh, the banking system. And there was a big political pushback to valuing sovereign debt um, at its market value for purposes of bank regulation because of the partnership between the sovereigns and the banks, especially important during the European crisis. So I just want to keep po pointing out that I think we have answers to a lot of important questions about improving bank regulation by making use of market information. What we don't have is the political will to do it. Very good. So we are nearing the end of the hour. Um, so maybe I could just hand back to, to Ernest with the wrap up. Let me just say, I thought it was a really interesting session and Charles, your paper already is a very good reference, I think, for, for financial crisis and, 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 and the commonalities that they may have or not. But I'm really looking forward to your book as well. So Ernest, Thank back you. to you. Thank you very much, Cornelia. This concludes our Swerf Buffy Bukoni lecture on the financial crisis and endless saga. Now, I cannot resist to draw some personal conclusions and takeaways for myself among the many uh, included in today's extremely rich and stimulating discussion. Uh, I have four conclusions for myself. The first one is study history if you want to understand the present and if you want to make assertions on the future. Second, it takes a good framework of thinking to learn from historical crises. Charles's taxonomy is an important contribution to this. We're all very much looking forward to your book. Third, Jan raised the point whether crises not almost by definition happen on new spots where central banks, regulators, supervisors uh, cannot expect them or did not expect them, or alternatively, as suggested by Charles, 
is human nature, political economy, the workings of political systems, states, including democracies, are they just unable to take the needed timely action to uh, curtail exuberance and therefore prevent crises? And fourth, preventing all booms and busts is commonly, commonly believed to be desirable, um, even if it is difficult. But we can actually not be entirely sure about this. Would this be at the cost of lower long-term growth and welfare, as you pointed out? So I leave you with these points and these questions. I really personally found uh, this, these presentations and this discussion highly stimulating. Thanks for, to Martin for setting this up, to Cornelia for moderating, to Charles, Nat and John for your presentations and discussions and to all of you for your interest, for your participation and for your questions. Bye-bye and take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.